it's got some flooding issues there, uh, lots of different things happening for this tree. And I want to contrast that with what's happening in the woods, um, because this is where those trees normally grow, uh, our trees that would like to live in kind of that forested setting. Um, and, and these kind of landscapes that we put them in, there are unique challenges there. And a lot of times what the trees struggle with is what we are doing. And so I think on the one hand, that's a little frustrating, but on the other hand, it gives us a lot of potential to um, solve those problems and to help those trees thrive. Um, so I found this figure that I thought thought was um, both really funny but also really true in how to kill a tree and the many different ways that we can kill trees in the landscape setting. Uh, whether it's, um, you know, watering wrong, damaging the roots with lawn equipment, uh, adding things to the tree that then restrict their growth and hurt them over time, uh, poor pruning practices. And I hear your last talk in the series was on pruning. So we'll connect to that a little bit, um, how they were planted to begin with. There are lots of different ways to um, inadvertently harm your trees, but it also means there's a lot that you can do uh, to avoid that and to promote those trees health. So what are the most common problems that I see with trees in the landscape setting? To start with, it's trees that got started off on the wrong foot. So right from the beginning, uh, these trees were not set up for success. And what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that maybe these trees were planted poorly. You know, if you think about trees, again, in the woodland setting, you know, they're, they're planting their, themselves. They are seeding, uh, maybe wildlife is taking them somewhere. But when we plant them, uh, we have a tendency, unfortunately, it's really common to, to plant trees wrong, to maybe plant them too deep. Uh, trees really don't want to be too deep. Otherwise, their roots can suffocate and it can really lead to problems down the road. It might look fine for the first few years and then over time, time that tree is just not going to thrive. It's going to decline more and more over time. So here's one example from the UK campus where I work. Um, and these were trees in a, in a newly built uh, student housing complex. And um, the trees were built by the landscaping uh, or by the, the trees were planted by the company that was hired to do so. And um, afterwards, uh, someone went and checked on those trees and turns out they were all planted like six inches to a foot too deep, which may not seem like a big deal. In fact, there's a lot of plants that you could plant too deep and, you know, they'd be fine. For a tree, that's a big problem. It might not look like anything, but if that tree, if the root flare of that tree, that part that kind of buttresses out right at the base, um, it wants to be in line with the soil. Um, if it's too far down, uh, those roots are going to suffocate. They're not going to have enough air. They need to breathe, surprisingly. But also, um, if soil or mulch is piled against that trunk, that's going to lead to rot and other issues down the road. So while it might look fine for the short term, in the long term, there's really, you know, if you don't, if you don't address that right at the beginning, it's a lot, lot harder to later. And you might wind up with girdling roots or other problems. These are roots kind of circling around and desperately trying to get access to oxygen and growing really weirdly um, because they were planted too deep to begin with. Um, so if you see trees that are, are look like little light posts, right, they have no buttress out at the base. Now some trees just kind of grow like that and that's, that's fine. But many times when I see that in the landscape setting, what I think is, oh shoot, those trees were planted too deep to begin with. And they're in this uphill battle for the rest of their life with something that, that could have been set up better, right, right at the onset. Because um, instead of getting the roots that you want, you've got all of these fine roots that are trying to get uh, air and they're trying to survive and they're really creating problems under the ground. You might not be able to see it, but it's a big deal for the tree. Another common problem that I see in that same vein is that the wrong tree was planted for the site. So this could be something like in this picture, um, you can see these trees that were planted under a power line, or maybe let's be generous and say the power line went in after, so they didn't know about it happening. But a lot of times I'll see trees uh, planted in places where they can't possibly thrive into the future. Large trees planted under power lines um, where they're obviously going to grow right into them and, and there's going to be a problem. Or maybe you've got a really big tree that likes a lot of soil and good drainage growing in the tiny little strip between the road and the 
the sidewalk. That tree is not going to thrive there. Um, in, in those cases, it's really better to pick a tree that's matched to that site, that's going to thrive there, that's not going to require a whole lot of hand holding. Um, and so I think that that's where uh, picking the right tree for the right site is important, whether we're talking about species, the size, or how it's going to grow. Another common problem that I see is the use of low quality trees, or in this case, uh, trees are invasive, um, you know, starting off with the wrong material. So this is, uh, I, I searched for cheap trees online and what did I find? A whole bunch of um, uh, calorie pear, Bradford pear trees for sale. Now there's a number of reasons why I wouldn't recommend these um, trees. You know, they don't last long, they fall apart fast. Um, they, they're better choices for the landscape setting in terms of that, but also those trees, calorie pear has become a huge invasive issue uh, in our natural areas, in old field sites and roadsides, because it takes over and clogs up what we want to be seeing with native plants um, that are going to um, grow into the future and become uh, these great ecosystems just clogged up with invasive species like calorie pear. So there's a number of reasons why I wouldn't recommend it. But on top of those, um, I think a lot of times people, when they're shopping for trees, try to get the cheapest thing they can find, right? You want to get a good deal. Um, but really, uh, plants and trees in particular, they are an investment. You're going to, they're going to live a long time. And I think it's worth it to spend more on the front end to get something that's the right species for your site, that's in really nice form, that's thriving, um, versus saving a few bucks and getting something that is already struggling or is not a good fit for what you've got. And you'll regret it down the road and then you'll pull it out or cut it down and wish that you'd spend a little bit more money on a tree that maybe was in better condition. Um, so another common problem that I see for trees in the landscape setting uh, is wear and tear over time. So this might be, uh, in the case of this photo here, damage from mowers and construction. This was an email I received a while back um, from someone who was managing this area and was wondering, you know, why are all these trees dying? And you can see that um, they've got the branch tips on the edges that are dying and it's kind of dying from the outside in, which to me is always a red flag for some kind of stress in that tree. Um, not necessarily one thing that's killing it, but some stress. And so closer inspection of those trees um, revealed that all of, and it was a lot of trees in this area, um, right around the base, and this one's got that really nice flare around the base, um, lots of damage, lots of damage from mowers over time, lots of soil compaction. And this is something that it might seem like no big deal, right? This is just a little nick. Surely tr the tree will be fine. Um, but, but no, actually, that's a great way to introduce fungi that can cause root rot and other problems. So kind of little, little damages adding up over time for trees. Um, whether it's from uh, mowing or construction or maybe poor pruning. And I bet you got a lot of this last session. Um, but you know, I see a lot of, of, of pruning like this, a lot of topping. Um, and it, I think people think that it's going to result in a neater looking tree. And there are some species that respond better to that. And there are some ways to um, uh, prune that might look like this, but actually really different. Um, but what they result in are really, really weak uh, branching on this tree that's more likely to fail. And again, each one of these is a great entry point for decay fungi. Um, once this has happened, you can't go back in time. You can't undo that. Um, so if you can stop that from happening to begin with, that's great. Um, but down the road, you're really looking at assessing the risk that's there as well as promoting the tree's health overall so that they can um, try to overcome some of those challenges. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to note about that is, is this concept, and I think this comes up a lot with trees, the idea that trees will heal. Trees don't actually heal. They will never heal. They're not like us. Um, instead, what they try to do is seal. So you can see right here, this is where a branch had been pruned previously. And it doesn't heal that spot. It's never going to heal it. Um, there's always going to be some dead tissue in there. Um, but what they do is they seal it off and they'll seal off that oak's exposed wood. They'll seal it off to prevent fungi and insects from getting in there to protect their internal heartwood from further decay. 
Um, but it's really tough for them once their bark is compromised. Um, they've got to seal that off as fast as they can, which requires some vigorous growth on the part of the tree. Uh, but it's hard for them to defend themselves past that point. So um, when a tree is wounded, an injured tree tissue is not repaired and it never heals. Um, trees wall off those injured tissues and then will continue generating new tissues. But I say that because all of these little stresses really add up. All of the little nicks and tears and pruning jobs can really add up over time. Trees are incredibly resilient and not to downgrade that, um, but we wanna think carefully about um, promoting the health of trees and all of the little things that can get in the way of that. So kind of combined, what I'd like you to take away from that wear and tear subject is that stressed trees result in avoidable problems. Uh, so something that might not normally be an issue if the tree is stressed can suddenly become a big issue, right? Something like uh, some native fungus or some minor rots not normally a major deal, but if the tree is stressed, all of a sudden that can become really important. So we wanna minimize stress in trees and promote health. Um, the next thing I wanna to touch on is kind of the oh no category. So we talked about trees that are off on the wrong foot, uh, wear and tear over time. And then you've got the oh no category. So all of the other things that can go wrong with your tree that there's really not a lot you can do to control. Things like insects and diseases and storms and droughts. Um, you know, there might not be much you can do to stop some of those things, uh, but helping you recognize those. And I think it's essential to determine, uh, you know, what's the problem? Is it something that you can control or is it something that you can't really impact? So it's all about promoting the health of those trees or thinking about what comes next. And when I think about that, the first thing that comes to mind for me in trees in the landscape setting is the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer is an invasive insect. Um, here you can see the adult beetle. Um, you rarely see this though, and that's not really what causes the damage to the trees. Um, it lays eggs, which hatch into larvae, um, and those larvae tunnel just below the bark in the vascular system of the tree. And you can see this larva uh, here, and there's just extensive tunneling, lots and lots of tunnels. And they basically damage the tree so bad from the inside that it can rapidly kill trees. Um, so the emerald ash borer, as its name suggests, uh, eats ash trees. And it can kill our ash trees, especially our green and white ash trees. Blue ash is a little bit more resistant, which we could talk about some more. Um, it can tolerate this insect a little bit better. Um, and it also can impact white fringe tree, which is a smaller tree, although not as much as the white and green ash, which in our area are just, um, if they're not dead or well on their way to it, they will be soon um, because it's been wiping them out. Uh, so what, what are the kind of things that you'd look for with the emerald ash borer? At this point, dead, dead trees, falling down trees, trees that are snapping in half. Um, early on, you'd find things like dead branches, a thinning uh, canopy or crown of a tree. You might see these D-shaped holes on the tree. That's the shape of the beetle when it chews its way out of the tree. Um, from being a larva, it, it grows into a mature beetle and will chew its way out into that kind of that D shape. Uh, so that lets you know that there were larvae in there and they were feeding and developing. Um, but definitely by the time you start to see the bark slothing off and these, you know, extensive tunnels on underneath, that tree is beyond saving and very damaged. Um, so this is kind of what I see a lot in this area, as well as trees with all of the bark flaking off, trees that have snapped in half in the last windstorm, um, you know, a, a major hazard um, in the landscape setting as well as in the woodland setting. So where are we with emerald ash borer right now? Uh, you can see it's really in most of the state. Um, it's an invasive insect that was first introduced to the Michigan area in probably the early 2000s. And it's spread down and it's spreading through our state right now. And this is a map of kind of where it is, but I think what's more useful, and this, these, both of these maps are from Kentucky Division of Forestry, who does a lot of monitoring 
and uh, uh, even aerial flying of the state to see, you know, where are ash trees dying from the emerald ash borer? And I think what's really useful is looking at this map, which shows you, you know, where are ash trees dead because of the emerald ash borer? And as you can see, in a lot of the state, uh, it's 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 pretty bad. And what this tells you is how long that insect has been there. So trees in those areas are dead or they're dying. And that really doesn't leave you with a lot of management uh, options at that point. Um, if you were to catch something before the tree was too damaged, there are insecticide options to protect individual trees. Um, but those are really only an option for, for healthy trees, for trees you really want to preserve in the landscape. Um, long term, hopeful that there's some resistance to that emerald ash borer that we can find in the wild, trees that aren't killed by it, that maybe have some natural defense uh, that could be used and in, in kind of promoted across the landscape. But in the short term, lots of trees are dying. And there's really, other than that insecticide treatment, not a lot of ways to stop that. Now I'm going to contrast that with some other really common issues that I see in landscape trees. Uh, things like fungal and site issues of conifers. So how many native conifers do we have to this area? Not many. So we've got red cedar, right? Um, and there are some pine trees that will grow in some areas. But there's a lot of popular conifers that are planted in the landscape setting. And they suffer from a wide range of issues. Um, certainly some fungal diseases, like in this photo, we've got needle cast disease, which is a disease of spruce trees. Um, in this photo, I've got Dothostroma needle blight, which is a problem for um, some of the pine species species that are not native to this area but are grown here. But I think in general I put site issues here because while um, fungal issues of conifers, whether they're needle issues like these or rots or other cankers um, are very common, the, the underlying issue is that our environment is really challenging for these trees. They're not native here. This is not where they're from. Um, the combination of our climate, of our soils, um, is a big challenge for them. So these trees are frequently under a lot of stress. So if you want to have these in the landscape setting, they either require a lot of input uh, on your end. Um, there are fungicides that can be used to protect those trees when they have those issues. Um, they require getting lucky or maybe matching that tree really carefully to the site that, that fits. Um, or they require temporary trees that you plant and then they die and you put them in. And I think all of those are pretty poor options. So my option instead would be to, again, think about site selection and think about that tree that you pick to put there. Instead of putting a blue spruce that you know is going to do poorly, pick a tree, a native species that you know is going to thrive there and is not going to require lots of input of your time. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of one of the things that I see a lot is, is uh, people, common yard tree issues with conifers is that that tree doesn't want to be in that site to begin with. So you're going to have an uphill battle the whole time. Um, so another thing that I see a lot of is bacterial leaf scorch. So it, it can be on a lot of different tree species, but here I'm showing it on oak because it's what I see the most common uh, in this area. And unfortunately, there's a lot of it and there's really nothing you can do to stop it once it's in a tree. It is a lethal disease, but it takes a long time to act. So that tree is gonna get progressively worse year after year after year. And there's not a good management solution for that once the tree has it. What you can do is try to prevent trees from getting it in terms of promoting the health of those trees. If you're pruning trees, sterilizing your equipment from tree to tree, because the way that this is spread is that it's in the vascular system of the tree. And what it's doing, the reason why these leaves look scorched, they look like they don't have water, is because they, they don't have water. Um, that tree's basically being um, strangled and doesn't have access to the water that it needs because it's got this bacteria that's clogging up its vascular system and preventing the flow of, of those, those things. So it's gonna get worse year after year after year. Um, so this is another one where I'd say it's a major issue in our area, especially in the, in the landscape setting. Um, but one of the ways that we can address it is to think about um, tree selection, think about diversity and think about 
um, increase in the diversity of areas so that if one tree gets it, not all of your trees are going to get it. You're going to have a diversity of different trees that buffers them from some of those issues. And then there's a lot of galls uh, that I see all the time, all sorts of different galls. Um, oak trees have uh, you know, just dozens of galls that you can find on a single oak tree. By and large, most of these don't really negatively impact the tree. They might look bad, they might look unsightly, and occasionally you can get situations where, uh, let's say, a, a gouty oak gall or a horned oak gall, like this photo here, um, would just fill that canopy and you'd get tons and tons of it and it could really negatively impact that individual tree. Very rarely um, do these cause major issues. Uh, so I think that this is, this is a case where they might be eye-catching, um, but they're unlikely to really hurt the health of those trees um, outside of a few cases. This is a cedar apple gall, uh, which looks really, really eye-catching when it, these teleal horns erupt in the spring on one of the first wet, warm days of the spring. Look for it in your cedar trees, uh, but it's not really a problem for cedar. It might look look uh, significant, um, typically not an issue. It can be more of an issue for its alternate host, um, apple trees, depending on the situation, um, uh, service berries, others in that family. Uh, but really, these are eye-catching things that might distract you from the other issues that are going on, the underlying issues that might be stressing those trees out. Another really common issue that I see are various root and heart rots. Um, so this is a photo of a tree. Um, I was doing a, a street tree inventory in town and uh, came across this one and couldn't resist taking a picture of it uh, because you can see these big fruiting bodies, these big conks, big mushrooms coming out of the base of that tree. You can see that this wood here is exposed and it's been digested. That wood is being rotted by that fungus that's eating that. Um, but I think what's, what's also significant is, I don't know if you can tell back here, this house is under construction, there's equipment everywhere. Um, this tree had clearly been wounded at the base repeatedly. And those, those wounds might not look like much, but they're a great entry point for decay fungi, like this Ganoderma species um, that will, will enter, normally wouldn't be able to enter because of the bark, um, but can enter and start rotting uh, the tree, uh, the, the wood on the inside or the roots um, there and cause damage. Now, uh, is this necessarily gonna kill the tree? Maybe not, you know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's gonna progress slowly over time. Um, but what it certainly, in, in my view, would indicate is a potential risk because while the tree, trees are resilient, they're amazing, that tree might live for a long time. Uh, it, it might also have a level of risk associated with it that, that needs to be looked at, needs to be considered by that homeowner because um, if they were to be really rotted on the inside, it might fall over and hit their house or something else. Um, so something that I would, I would think about. So I want to kind of touch on something that I, I said earlier, but I think is really, really relevant in a landscape setting is that insects and pathogens can cause problems. And emerald ash borer is a great example of one that came through that is you know, causing major issues for ash trees. And there's not a lot that we can do to stop it. But most insects and pathogens cause minor issues. Many, however, can kill stressed trees and relatively few things can attack and kill healthy trees. So what does this all mean? It means that if your trees aren't stressed, if your trees are growing vigorously, um, you know, we can't, we can't control for things like a new invasive species like emerald ash borer coming in. You can't really stop that. But what you can do is you can save them from all sorts of other opportunistic issues that might kill them um, if they're stressed but they can defend themselves against if they're growing well. Uh, so a lot of kind of where I'm going from here, of course, is, all right, well, how do we get those trees to grow well? And I think that a lot of times, you know, what triggers concern in someone 
is, oh, my tree's dying. Um, the branches are dying. There's no leaves. Um, how could this have happened? It's happened suddenly. But in the landscape setting, that can totally be true. And not to say it doesn't happen, it definitely happens. Um, there are fungal diseases, uh, wilts that can come in and, and it, trees can be killed really rapidly. Um, the emerald ash borer, for example, can kill a tree pretty rapidly. Um, but a lot of times what causes the problem might have happened years ago and might not be as apparent. So what you're dealing with is the result of that, the result of a stress tree. So maybe it's really obvious, like in this case, huh? <laughs> it's not always this obvious where the tree has been paved right up to the base of it, um, has no good rooting area. You know, that's an obvious bad problem. Uh, for that tree's health long term. But sometimes it's less obvious. Sometimes the tree was planted too deep 20 years ago, and uh, you might not know it, you might not have thought of it, uh, maybe someone else planted the tree, but that's what caused the problem. And what you're dealing with is the legacy of that. Maybe what caused the problem is someone selected a species that just does really poorly in this area. And um, that's, that's the root of the problem um, versus the symptoms or the, the kind of opportunistic diseases that come along with that, if that makes any sense. So with that, I kind of want to shift over into uh, kind of how then do you have healthy trees? How would you promote healthy trees. Um, and oh, before I do, I see that we got a question about our pin oak with tip blight this fall. Um, I'm not sure which tip blight you're referring to. There's a Botrysphaeria um, blight that I commonly see on oaks, if that's the one that, that you had seen or got um, a positive report for. If, if so, if it's the Botrysphaeria, um, I would kind of class that with, with a lot of other issues of oak and that it might get progressively worse over time. Uh, but really, it's an issue of stressed trees and promoting the health of those trees will go a long way. Pin oaks are not terribly long lived, especially for oaks. They're not going to be long lived trees. And so I think in a lot of, um, at least what I've seen in a lot of neighborhoods, is that a lot of the pin oaks that are growing on, as street trees um, have restricted root access. They're not growing in optimal conditions and they're kind of entering the upper upper end of their life expectancy in a site like that. And so all of a sudden you get a lot of other issues with those trees, um, whether it's a tip blight or various rots um, or galls or you know other things that kind of uh, hypoxylum canker uh, that'll, that'll pop up on those. And you can address those individual issues, um, but really what you want to be doing is promoting the health of those trees, um, as well as thinking about the long term. Um, if those trees are already, and I don't know your situation at all, um, so I, I won't comment on it, but if you're in an area that has a lot of those um, trees that are at the upper end of their life expectancy, thinking about, all right, what is this going to look like when those trees start to go? Um, do we have younger trees that are coming up that can take their place? Um, if not, thinking about uh, planting those trees, thinking about the diversity that you want to plant instead of planting rows and rows of pin oaks, thinking about adding some diversity in there because right now they're all going to fail and be about the same age, right? Which, which means you have a big loss versus having a more diverse community that's going to have different problems, but they're not all going to be the same problem at the same time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. So what are my four tips? Just four, right? That's easy to remember. Um, four tips for healthy trees. Number one is pick the right tree. And the right tree is the right tree for you, the right tree in your site. It's not going to be the same right tree for everybody. Uh, plant carefully and correctly. Take care of those trees that you have. It's good to plant trees, but it's even better to take care of the trees that you have because, um, you know, the, the, the tree, um, the longer it's around, the bigger it gets, the more it's doing uh, for your site in terms of stormwater runoff, in terms of habitat for wildlife, in terms of uh, storing carbon, in terms of a lot of different things, in terms of shade on a hot day, which I really like. Um, and then consult with a tree professional when appropriate. Um, I think, you know, it's just not in our culture to think about hiring an arborist or, arborist or think about tree professionals, but I'm going to encourage you and put, connect you to some resources for that because I think it's really beneficial. All right, so picking the right tree. 
match the tree to the spot. A lot of times I'll see someone, you know, they plant, they plant a tree, maybe you love bur oak or, or, you know, a big, big oak tree and plant it somewhere where it looks really good right now. But keep in mind that, that trees grow <laughs> and it, it might not be the right spot uh, 20 years from now. Um, so, so plan ahead and plan for the size of tree that you're going to get. Match the tree to the spot that you have. Does it drain poorly? All right, then get a tree that, that, that deals with that well. Um, is it really dry? Uh, you know, like what, what's going on in that site uh, that you can match appropriately? Um, and then similarly, if you know some things about yourself and what you want, what do you want out of it? Because that's going to be different for everyone. What works for me might not be the same for you. So for example, let's say you want to have really, really nice lawn under your tree. Um, you might want to avoid species that have, or you want to plant it kind of near your house. You might want to avoid those species that are going to have really invasive or shallow roots, that might be a problem. And you don't want to plant a tree right next to the foundation of your house then. Let's say you don't want a messy tree. You don't want a lot of upkeep. I love persimmons. I planted a persimmon in my backyard. I think they're fantastic. And I also have a yellow poplar right here in my backyard. But they're not, they're going to be the right tree for everyone if you don't want to deal with that. You know, pick a species that's going to, going to match with what you want. Um, I think it's always safe to say don't get a tree that's going to fall apart rapidly, but especially don't get a tree if you want a tree that's going to live for a long time. Don't get a tree that has a life expectancy of like 20 to 30 years. Um, otherwise, you'll be you'll be sadly surprised by that. Uh, and with this, I would also class this is a picture of a of a Bradford pear. Don't pick invasive species. Uh, they won't do what you want in your landscape and then they'll have negative consequences outside of there. Um, so another couple examples, if you want to have a really nice garden under your tree, you might not want something that produces dense shade. If you want dense shade, get something that produces dense shade. Uh, I love catalpas and you know think they're beautiful and great, but maybe not the best tree for everyone. Um, but certainly avoid short-lived trees with known issues. The Colorado blue spruce is one. This is one of the flowering uh, uh, cherries, the ornamental cherries. You know, they, they, they're great for some people, but if you know that you don't want to spend a lot of time, spend a lot of effort on managing them, there are better choices. So I'm a big advocate of um, diversity and selecting from native species that are going to do well in your site and aren't going to require a lot of handholding. And I think there's just such such a diversity of different options that are out there, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, so, so instead of going into all that, I just figured I'd show some beautiful photos of some of my favorite uh, uh, trees that I think could be planted more in the landscape setting. So these might be big trees, tall trees with beautiful fall color. These might be smaller trees that have great um, foliage or great uh, flowers. There's lots of different options. And I'd encourage you to think about, um, you know, what's out there, but also think about diversifying with natives because, um, you know, over and over again, unfortunately, we have an invasive that comes in and wipes out a, a type of tree. So these are elms. This is a, tr a street that was lined with American elm. Beautiful, right? Just gorgeous. Oh, all American elm. And that looks great until Dutch elm disease comes in and wipes out all the elm. And so then what happened? Okay, people planted the same streets with ash, um, which is beautiful and it's a great tree. And both of those are native species and they're great, but you know, uniform ash. And then the emerald ash borer comes in and wipes out ash. So now the new go-to is to plant your streets with just line it with red maple, which I love red maple. Red maple is a great species, but there are insects in North America right now, invasive insects that can wipe out maple. So I think the lesson to learn from that is about diversity. And instead of planting the same species all throughout, um, hedging your beds and getting different species. Not only does it give you some buffer room against invasive species that are undoubtedly going to arrive. I'm going to do my part in forest health to stop them, but 
if history has shown us anything that we will get more. Um, but it also gives you more diversity in terms of, you know, the different folk color that you get uh, in terms of issues that can impact them in terms of the support that they provide to insects and wildlife. Uh, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a good strategy for a number of reasons. All right, next up, planting carefully and correctly. Uh, because, you know, there's some strategy, there's some planning required for planting a tree, and there's lots of different ways that trees come when you, when you get them from the nursery. Uh, you might get a bare root seedling, you might get a container grown uh, tree, you might get a bald and burlap uh, tree, and they all have, you know, slightly different things that you do, strengths and weaknesses, there's no one right answer, um, that if people have questions we can talk about. But a few rules of thumb for planting uh, in the landscape setting would be, if possible, plant during dormancy. So plant when, after the trees have lost their leaves in the fall, fall can be a great time to plant, plant in the spring, uh, you know, early. Uh, and I think that, that helps the tree because it gives them a little time to establish before the, the heat of summer. Um, one of the biggest problems for recently planted trees is water and, and that the root system, because they really, really need to establish a good root system. That's the most important thing that they do in their first few years. Because think about it, they've been transplanted, they've been moved around and they've lost a lot of that root system. So they need to put that back on. So you can help that a little bit by planting them during dormancy if possible or giving them some extra care if not giving them a little, you know, attention, some water um, when they need it. Um, another point would be to locate and avoid underground utilities before digging, and you can call 811 for that. Not only is that required, is that the law, but uh, it's just a good idea because let's say you plant a tree over a utility and then they've got to come in and dig it up, uh, you know, a few years from now, right when the tree starts putting on growth and looking really good, you're going to be super bummed about that. Uh, so, so save yourself some headache there. Um, identify the root flare of the tree. This sounds easier than it actually is because Sometimes when you purchase a tree, when you get it from the nursery, um, especially let's say you have a, a bald and burlap tree that's been wrapped up, it's in a ball, the root system is in a ball and it's been wrapped up in burlap. Those are typically going to be planted a little bit deeper than you actually want to plant them in the field. So in that nursery setting, they've got to grow them a particular way and they want to protect that root layer. So there's probably going to be several inches of soil above the root flare, you've got you've to gotta dig down and find where that root flare is to determine how deep to plant that tree to set it up for success. So if you're not familiar with what a root flare is, um, uh, check out some trees. And it's this part right here where the, the, it goes from being the trunk to being the roots and kind of flares out. And each species is going to look a little differently. And this is going to um, you know, be differently important for. But in general, you want to have this right at the soil level. You want the roots underground. You want the trunk above ground. And you don't really want to mix those two up. It's, it's, if anything, better to have it a little bit high than to have it too low. Um, so next, dig a wide hole. So depth is important. You got to get that root flare at the right level. But dig it much wider than you'd think, because that will give those roots a chance to really grow and establish, which again is really key for those recently planted trees. Completely unpack your tree. If you're dealing with, with a tree that came like this, take all of the burlap off, take all of the wire that you can get off, all of the string, all of the packaging material. Even if they say that you can leave it on and it will degrade, um, it will be a lot better the more that you take off um, because you want to give those roots every advantage, every chance to grow out and thrive because that's, that's key for your tree. Um, you know, I think people ask me about fertilizer for trees and fertilizing young trees and we, we can't feed trees. Trees feed themselves. They're perfectly capable of doing that um, by photosynthesizing. And fertilizer is generally discouraged for um, trees, especially uh, newly planted trees. Now this depends if you're, if you're dealing with um, fruit trees or nut trees, orchard setting, totally different. Um, but, but in the landscape setting, fertilizer is not generally necessary. What you really need to do is to promote the ability of those trees to grow and thrive. Um, and there are exceptions to that, but as a, as a general rule. So if you're, especially if you have a container grown tree, check for girdling roots and prune those if necessary. Then carefully place your tree 
at the proper height. So here's kind of an image of what that might look like with the flare right there at the soil level, getting rid of all of that um, uh, packaging that comes with those trees so those roots can grow out in a nice wide hole. And then backfill that hole with soil, not new soil, not potting mix, but that same soil that you got out of there, um, gently but firmly. And so this is a, a newly planted tree that I planted last um, fall. And uh, you can see it's a really wide hole for the site, right? <laughs> you might be surprised by that. Um, but I think that'll set it up for success going forward. Um, not that trees can't thrive if they don't have optimal conditions. They do that all the time. But these are kind of my tips for really, really setting it up for, for, for good growth. Um, so third, take care of your trees once they are there. Um, so this is especially true for recently planted trees. And that's things like watering and structural pruning to get them started off on the right foot. Um, but in general, promoting the vigor of those trees that are, that are already in your landscape setting. Um, because stress trees result in avoidable problems that you, you don't need. You can, you can try to um, do everything you can to promote those trees so you don't have to deal with those issues. So what are some examples of taking care of trees? Um, first off, I would list mulching and proper mulching, because there's, there's ways to mulch trees that help the trees and there's ways that hurt the trees. Um, so this is what I see a lot of, the good old volcano mulching. And, uh, you know, that's a problem. That's a problem because you will uh, result in roots that are growing really poorly that, that basically makes the tree planted too deep, even if it was planted correctly. And there now, now the tree is planted too deep and you've got a tree that's suffocating and doesn't have access to the air it needs in the roots. And it's gonna do weird things to respond to that. Um, in addition, if you pile the mulch around the base of the tree, the trunk is not equipped to, you know, to be underground. Um, it, it wants to not be above, it wants to be above ground. And so piling that mulch around it will result in decay and rot of that area. So, you know, don't do it. Don't do it to your trees. Instead, uh, you can mulch with a nice, wide, but shallow mulch ring. Uh, so some mulching tips. Mulch out to the drip line if possible. Look at this tree. It's got so much mulch. It's all around it. But you don't have to do this. And I think uh, any amount of kind of mulch is, is good for some reasons. You know, uh, this, there's a lot of different reasons why mulch is beneficial for trees. It creates a good habitat for those trees. Um, it's going to prevent competition with other species of the lawn uh, that would normally suck up a lot of that water that those trees would want. Um, but I think one of the most important things that it does in the landscape setting is prevent mower damage. Because if you're not having the mower right up to the base of that tree, uh, that's really beneficial because you're not going to get those little nicks on the tree that can be perfect entry points for decay fungi. Um, so really, anything is good, but don't have that mulch right up on top of that tree trunk. Um, typically, depending on the type of mulch you're using, around two to four inches is plenty. You don't want too much mulch. And instead of kind of piling it all on at once, it's more of a reapply as needed type of deal. So there's lots of mulches out there and it can feel overwhelming. All of the different amounts of mulch, which type of mulch should you get? You know, a lot of these will protect trees from mower damage and I like that about them. But these mulches, the ones that are organic, the ones that will break down over time, that fungi will break down over time, they will contribute to the soil. They'll build the soil in those areas over time. And that's a long process that takes, takes many years. Um, but if you add wood chips, um, that's gonna be something that, that fungi can break down and eat and will kind of contribute to the health of those areas. Stone, rock, shredded rubber, they're not really doing any of that. Uh, so they might look nice and they might protect from mower damage, but they're not giving you all of these other benefits that different types of mulches can. So another way to take care of your trees is watering them. And when I Google watering trees, I get all sorts of images for how to water your trees. Um, and you know, it's everything from this person with a watering can to this soaker hose, to this um, tree bag that you fill up with water. 
and um, then it slowly waters the tree over time. Um, what I would really emphasize is that trees, they're not like tomatoes in your garden. You can't just kind of hose them down briefly or, or spray them for a little while and, and that's gonna work. Um, those aren't good approaches. Uh, what trees really like is they like to be watered deeply, um, but then to dry out a little bit, but you know, have regular deep watering. And how do you accomplish that? Uh, I mean, rain, right? Think about rain and think about what rain does. Um, it's going to be uh, not just a little sprinkle on the top or a whole bunch of water all at once, but maybe if you're setting this up with your hose outside, you could do something like set it up at a, a, at a trickle and then move it around your tree over the course of a few hours, just kind of letting it trickle away. Um, and if you don't, if you're not getting any rain, doing that uh, once a week. Or this is a soaker hose, which kind of does the same thing. You turn it on, let it really water the tree deeply, and then turn it off. So you don't have like a continuous irrigation system because trees do not like most trees. There are exceptions having wet feet. They don't like being soaked all the time. And this bag does the same thing. You put a lot of water in it, um, and then it will trickle and that water uh, to the roots of the tree, and then you'll fill it back up maybe once a week if you're not getting rain. But being aware of uh, watering trees when they need it. And then if they don't, if you're getting plenty of rain, you don't have to. Uh, so another point on taking care of trees, and I won't, I won't touch on this too much because I know you addressed it last week, is proper pruning. You know, these are, these are poor pruning cuts. Why? Because they don't help the tree help itself. They don't allow the tree, they're not gonna heal, right? They're gonna seal. And uh, what, where does the tree um, make the tissues that it needs to seal? Uh, right in this branch collar right here. So this one, it's, it's too far. Um, it's gonna be really hard for that tree to, to seal that over, these little stubs. And then this one, it's too deep. This is a huge wound, a big exposed area versus something much smaller that could have been cut if it had been at slight angle. Um, so like something like this, right? These are really good pruning cuts that create small wounds um, that the tree can then try to um, uh, produce new tissue to seal those over. So there's, there's different techniques in, in proper pruning that I know you touched on last week, but you want to avoid any further damage to the tree because every pruning cut is, is damage to that tree. You want to minimize that damage. You want to help that tree moving forward. Um, similarly, if you have construction or mower damage or something like that, you want to protect those trees from any damage. So instead of having, you know, the trees might be there, but their roots are probably really impacted and things are really compacted there. Um, so if you're doing something like a construction project, uh, you want to fence that off and prevent that from being damaged. Because you can't really, I mean, you can, there are ways to do it. And arborists have amazing tools for this kind of thing, but it's much easier to protect it on the front end than to try to address that damage retroactively. And then finally, consult with a tree professional when you need to. So I just wanna throw this out here. Diagnosing tree problems is tough. Site and its history are key because you can kind of, you might be able to diagnose what you see on that leaf but it doesn't really tell you about the site and the history that might be driving what's happening now in your tree. It can be really hard to pinpoint any one factor sometimes. Sometimes it's really clear. You have the emerald ash borer, all right, that's it. Um, but other times it's really hard to pinpoint one factor that's driving things. Um, and there are lots of different issues that can stress trees over time that make them susceptible to secondary issues. Um, some of times this requires lab work to confirm. So there are numerous fungal diseases that, um, you know, I could look at and say, hmm, it could be that. But to be sure, we would have to send it to the diagnostic lab to be certain. Um, and sometimes, even when you know what the problem is, there are a few management options. Let's talk about like root rot. Uh, you can know that it's root rot but there's not a fungicide that you can spray on that tree that's gonna solve the problem. Uh, so, you know, it really is important to think about preventative and think proactively. 
So with that, I just want to like really, really recommend the work that extension agents do. They can connect you to resources like your plant diagnostic lab, like specialists if needed. But a lot of times they have the answer. They've seen other people who've had these exact issues and they can tell you what's worked for them and they can steer you to resources for next steps. I also want to mention arborists who are, you know, trained tree professionals really different from just someone who's going door to door with a chainsaw who who maybe can do great work with that chainsaw but might not know a lot about trees and how to care for them you know arborists uh, a knowledgeable arborist is incredibly valuable they're paid professionals and um, you know a really good one is a fantastic resource uh, if you're shopping around for an arborist, things that I'd recommend is look for membership in professional societies. The International Society of Arboriculture is the main one, ISA, and look for proof of insurance, look for references that any good arborist would be able to provide you. And if you're looking for an arborist, uh, the International Society of Arboriculture, ISA, um, actually has a website where you can put in your zip code and find all of the certified arborists in your area, which is pretty cool. Uh, so I just wanted to point you towards that resource. Um, at Trees Are Good, find an arborist. So with that, I just want to emphasize there's lots of resources here to help you with your tree problems, whether it's your county extension agents, the plant diagnostic lab that they can connect you to, um, extension fact sheets on different issues, various newsletters that are out there, and of course, social media. Um, if you like learning about this kind of thing, tree health or forest health, um, check out at KY Forest Health. We try to post a mix of different things, especially timely issues as they come up. And um, hopefully this was helpful today. But if you have any questions, I'd love to address those now. And to start us off with, I see that we had a question. How can you protect roots that are on the ground surface in areas that need to be mowed? Um, so I guess that would be my first thought is, uh, making it so you don't have to mow those areas. So either mulching them um, or you can plant them with species that uh, will serve as a not competitive ground cover, herbaceous species, like grass is tough, right? But there's lots of other um, plants that you could use in those landscaping settings. Uh, but mulching is really convenient with that because then you just get to bypass that whole thing. And you can plant plants in there. 